Hello everyone, we're coming on a, a lot earlier these days to allow Ginger the time to grab an encrypting code for us so that we can do a new thing at Baldwin Community. We are um, trying to go live on Facebook uh, where you can greet each other and, and offer words to each other, but we're also trying to go live on our website at the same time. Uh, when we go live on our Facebook uh, and it's connected to our website, you'll be able in a different way if you head over to the website to be able to see what we're doing, any announcements, um, be able to send us prayer concerns that are private and sent directly to the pastors on our website, you'll also see that there's opportunity for online giving. So uh, there's a couple different ways we're trying to, to make this easier for everyone to uh, be a part of this discipling that we are doing almost every day at Baldwin Community online. Um, electronically and, and flexibly so that you can watch or react when you have the time and it fits in your schedule, but it's always there for you. What a great day, huh? It's a little bit cooler today and it's the sun is really trying its hardest to come out, but it's nonetheless still a great and glorious, beautiful day for us to um, be with each other as you come on in the room. Don't be shy. Uh, greet each other uh, Extend a good morning to each other as we gather in. Hey Colette um, Hope everything's good up in Erie there um, Good to see your name. Hey Ginger um, Hopefully everything is working the way it's supposed to this morning uh, with ease and um no disasters happening. Um, it's good to see you all and I hope that you are having a good day as we get closer to 11 o'clock. I'm just going to talk for a little bit so that we are sure that we're connected in both places. Um, I myself, uh, after going live, I think I'm going to go outside and mow. This just seems like a day that's going to be cool enough. Hey, Wendy, um, to warrant some mowing and get ahead because it looks like it's going to be a fabulous weekend. Um, warm and hot and sunny. Uh, I, know, I know a lot of people since we've gone yellow in the state of Pennsylvania have really started talking about going camping this weekend. I myself am not a camper unless it has Hilton on the front of it. Um, but I get the, like the need to go out and be out and um, just get away from our houses for a little bit of time. What a crazy, crazy season this has been. Um, so I hope you have big plans for the weekend and that um, those plans are coming together. Maybe a fire pit. Hey, Helen, good to see a fire pit in the backyard or, or just a walk in the neighborhood. However you try to enjoy this holiday uh, weekend, I hope it's going to be a great, great, great celebration. I haven't got that far yet. I just know that after this, I'm probably going to mow. So it's hard to make plans these days when we're just not sure from day to day what's going on. So um, as we get closer to our 11 o'clock hour here, again, welcome. I do have one more announcement that I would like to sort of talk about before we go into our time of devotion at midday here. Uh, we are doing Family Feud on May 31st. Uh, Justin, uh, who we all enjoy his spirit and his liveliness uh, as the Director of Discipleship, uh, has decided that he's going to host a family food game on May 31st at 5 o'clock. In order to be a part of this, um, you have to register by the 30th because we're going to keep score and we're going to divide um, families and individuals up into groups and we're going to keep that score and celebrate winners and um, just have a really good time. But we do need to, everybody, if you're going to be a part of that, to register um, by the 30th so that I, who am the scorekeeper for the evening, can um, do my, my job with uh, some sense and reason and, and we never want to 
offend anybody when we're playing games because some of us are good losers and some of us are not. So, um, again, welcome. We've got our announcements out of the way and it is time to pause in the middle of the day and, and just invite God into this moment. So, uh, will you come with me into something that we have been doing for the last several weeks. And this, today, since it's not been chaotic, um, I will actually remember the right words. So will you just sort of close your eyes and take a deep breath and whatever cares that br you brought in with you this morning, just sort of put them aside and hear these words. Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am. Be still and know Be still. Be. God, in the stillness of this morning, we come before you. We come this morning out of some measure of comfort. We are in our homes and we are surrounded by the things that bring us great joy and support our lives. But at the top of this day, some of us are aware of what's happening in our neighborhood in Michigan where the dams have burst and people in the middle of a pandemic are being chased out of their homes, out of the realm of things that have made their life possible for these past few weeks into uh, another great unknown. We pray for families that they might be safe with one another. We pray for security for people that as this unexpected moment has fallen upon them that there might be good people out there waiting to help and lifting them up. God, we continue to pray for those who are suffering from COVID-19. We're watching and waiting. We, we are just so uncertain about what is going to be happening next. But we know that you are God. And in the stillness of that affirmation this morning, we pray that you might come and be with us in these few moments. Be our security. Be the focus of our lives. This we pray. Amen. Our gathering thought comes from this book, um, The Soul's Slow Ripening by Christine Walters, painter, and in the middle of a, pa a poem, she wrote this sentence that I sort of grabbed and, and really have been offering you for the last few weeks. It sounds like this. Is there a place for each of us where we no longer yearn to be elsewhere? where our work is simply to soften, wait, and to pay close attention. I, I, I love that because it really, I, I know how I go about my day where I just wanna race off into all of the things that I have to do, but what if the goal of all of our lives, in spite of all that we have to do and, and the goals of our day our, our daily goal could be to soften before our lists and to wait and to pay close, close attention to what God is trying to reveal to us today. Our scripture comes from the book of 1 Samuel. If you don't have your Bibles, you can run and get it. Um, the, we're in the 16th chapter. There's a lot going on in this chapter. 
uh, the king, a new king is being selected in spite of the fact that Israel already has a king. Uh, there, it's sort of a preemptive motion, uh, a nod to things are not going as well as the people of Israel had hoped they would after spending long seasons begging for a king so that they could look like all their neighbors. This king that they begged for really wasn't what they'd hoped for, and now a new king is being chosen <clears throat> out of a series of sons. And in verse 7, there's a, a verse that said, where Samuel is, is hearing from God, Do not look upon the appearance or the height of stature, because I have rejected him, for the Lord does not see mortal see as mortals see. They look only on the outward appearance, but God looks upon the heart. David is eventually called, but there's another story that's tucked right close into this calling where God is honoring David, where we see the madness of Saul. So I'm going to read that today as well. And now the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord tormented him. And Saul's servants said to him, See now an evil spirit from God is tormenting you. Let our Lord now command the servants who attend to you to look for someone who is skillful in playing the lyre. And when that evil spirit from God is upon you, he will play it and you will feel better. So Saul said to his servants, Provide for me someone who can play well and bring them to me. One of the young men answered, I have seen a son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite, who is skillful in playing. He's a man of valor, of good presence, of prudent speech, a warrior, and the Lord is with him. So Saul sent messengers to Jesse and said, Send me your son David, who is with the sheep. Jesse took a donkey loaded with bread, a skin of wine, and a kid, and sent it by his son David to Saul. And Saul came to David, entered his service, and Saul loved him greatly. And he became his armor bearer. Saul sent to Jesse, saying, Let David remain in my service, for he has found favor in my sight. And whenever the evil spirit from God came upon Saul... David took the lyre and played with it in his hands, and Saul would be relieved and feel better, and the evil spirit would depart from him. This is the word of God for the people of God. Amen. So we're almost done with this theme of passive versus active waiting. And today's theme is humility. Humility. And humility fits right in the wheelhouse of passive waiting. Humility really does call you and I to stop what we're doing, stop the, the direction that we're heading in order to ponder and reflect and open our, our lives and our minds to God so that we're putting aside our willfulness and being shaped by the hand of God in a way that we can't when we're actively waiting, when we're wanting God to fit in the mold that we are setting before God. God, won't you answer this prayer and then do it this way? And this active leaning is, or waiting is sort of leaning into where we are wanting God to, to end up. But passive waiting and humility really has the capacity for you and I to say, really, God, not my will, but thine. Teach me how to live in that posture. Not my will, but thine. So I hope that you have good luck this week as you entertain the thought of what passive waiting might be for you and me. A short prayer. O oh God, may the meditation of my heart and my mouth be a blessing to us as we gather this day. 
to reflect on your word and to open up our lives so that you might look in and see who we've been and shape who we are becoming. This is our prayer. Amen. So like I said, for years, the people of Israel begged for a king. It didn't matter that God had been with them since their liberation from the, their slavery in Egypt, that God had gone with them in cloud and fire through 40 years of wandering in a desert. It didn't matter that God made a way into a promised land after the waiting in the, the desert was over. It, none of that mattered because all the people of Israel could see was their neighbors had a king, and they didn't. And they began to compare themselves to their neighbors in such a way that they really began to miss the gifts that God was trying to give to them, and most importantly, the gifts of a, a divine intimacy with God who was saying, I will be your God, you will be my people, but that wasn't enough. Also, that God could be so very present with the people was another gift, that God was somehow visible at the tabernacles and at the, the, the tents and in the, the sky and everywhere around them, God providing quail and manna, this ever-present God, knowing their need was still not enough, just not enough. They wanted to be like their neighbors. And they wanted that now, even if it wasn't in their best interest. And so eventually God relents and allows the people of Israel to have what they asked for. And so God selects a king named Saul. And things seem to go fairly well at the beginning. But power and then followed by madness seems to consume this king that the people thought they so wanted. And it wasn't until well into his, his realm, people began to think to themselves, maybe we made a mistake. Maybe this wasn't the best choice after all, and it might just be too late. It's a wonderful thing to be able to read chapter 16 of 1 Samuel and see that in spite of possible mistakes, God still had a plan and that Samuel had been sent to Jesse to discern who the next king would be and which child of Jesse God's favor would fall upon. And we know that that's King David and how all the details come together and God's favored David becomes a part of King Saul's court. But even in this story, we get a sense of that Saul, God isn't completely done with Saul. Even though the madness and the power and the evil spirits that are set upon him uh, really are undoing his, his presence within Israel, uh, we do get a glimpse of possible moments of humility as servants say, you know, you know, King, when these evil spirits set upon you, we've noticed that music does your soul good. So why don't you um, bring into the court someone who could help you? And we see that awareness in the reading of, Paul, of Saul saying, that's so true. I, when music is played, I feel better about myself. And so David is invited into the court to regain some control and to keep God's story moving forward. And Saul um, continues to do uh, mad and wonderful things in the meantime. I think this story and the connection of these stories are a great example of the difference between false piety and, and what humility really is. False piety is that resistance that we have when somebody comes up to us and says, you know, you're, you're so good at 
this and such, or I have noticed something about you that I so appreciate. And instead of allowing that praise to come to us and settle in our self-awareness, we begin to say, oh no, you can't, please don't say that. Please don't say that. I'm, not, I'm just like everybody else. I don't have anything really special going on about me. So well, no, no, no. But at the same time, we're resisting. We're sort of going, keep it coming, keep it coming. False piety is a little bit of a lie where we are posing that we don't want any affirmation of what we do well and why we do it well, while at the same time wanting to hear what people have to say to us. <clears throat> and as people catch on to the lie of our life, I think they say things to us just to keep us happy or where they want us to be. Humility is different. I think humility is a self-awareness, a, a self-understanding that we are able to have for ourselves where we look at who we are and say to ourselves, you know, I really enjoy doing this. And when I do this thing, I feel like God is blessing me and I feel like I have something to give back to the world because I've sort of seen the fruits of that behavior or the fruits of that gift. And, and I pray that I'm using these gifts that God just naturally gives to me to God's glory. Can you feel the difference between false piety and a humility that accepts and realizes what God is trying to do in our lives. I think humility is honest, it is faithful, and it's true when we're able to reach for it rather than pushing off what others are trying to give to us in a gift. Humility is graceful or grace-filled. Holly Whitcomb says there's five reasons why humility is grace-filled for us. Oh, that we can come and rely on these things as we hone our skills for being humble or self-aware in this world. Her first um, gift of humility is that humility leads us to the grace of God. It, humility says to us, when you, when you get to the edges of your life and you're not sure what to do next, how do you lean on God? How do you allow God to shape and mold you out of your natural inclinations and your natural giftedness in order to move forward and to move forward well? Not imposing your will upon each uh, on people around you, but by using your gifts to bless and enable and invite people to be a part of your ongoing story. Two, humility leads us to love rather than achievement. The people around us are not commodities to be used in the way that we want them to use, be used and in the way that they gift us. Saul used David as a commodity to ease his soul. But I think by using David to ease his soul, he missed the opportunity to look at David and really love him. I think there are people in our lives who who are commodities to us and the more we use them as commodities how you how you resource my life um I I fail to see a way or a means to love you humility calls us to love people in our lives for who they are already and how they can connect to our life in beautiful ways Third, humility uh, invites us or leads us to honor other people. When we stop long enough to see how beloved the people in our life are, we then begin to see how blessed they are and what gifts and graces and joys they bring into our lives. And those gifts and graces and joys aren't for us to use. They're for us to lift up and say, it is so wonderful when you offer this to the world. I see your blessedness. I see your gift. And I see how you're honoring God. And we become a part of this great lifting up of the people of God. 
four, humility leads us to live without judgment. Ouch. Humility invites us to live without judgment. If we are not happy with ourselves, then we are naturally going to heap our judgment on other people so that we can bring other people down to our level or so we think in our minds. Humility says you don't have to do that. You're already lifted to a high enough place as it is. You don't have to judge other people. So humility guards us to guide our hearts and our minds and our positions on other people so that judgment doesn't rule the day. But we go back to number three and we find ways to love people who, who for some reason or other, we find the need to judge. Five. Honesty leads us to a, a full sense of self-assessment. Honest, true, this is what I'm doing right in my life. This is what I'm not doing right in my, my life. This is where I need to do some perfecting. And this is where I think I've gotten it all right. And it feels good and wonderful. We're able to see our positive and our negatives in the same light. And use them both to build our lives in the way that God would want our lives to be lived. For God doesn't see what we're doing or how we're doing it necessarily, it, it, but God sees our heart in how we are doing things and why we are doing things in this world. And if God can see our heart, it certainly should um, bring us to a place where our self-reflection changes everything about the how and why we're doing things in this world. So waiting in humility then brings us closer to the, the lives that God really does desire for us. Not to soothe our, ourselves when evil spirits come upon us, but to live lives of absolute joy and delight every day. Because we know we have enough. And we're humble enough to know that we've got, a, got going to get it right today and we're going to get it wrong today. But through it all, we're a child of God. Marianne Williamson, in a, her writing, offers to us these words. Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that frightens us most. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? You are a child of God. Your playing small does not serve this world. There's nothing enlightening about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. We were born to make manifest the glory of God that is within us. It's not just in some of us. It is in everyone. And as we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give it to other people. Permission to do the same things. As we are liberated from our own fear, our presence automatically liberates all who are around us. Now that is a word of good news. Will you join with me in a word of prayer? God, many of us have been taught in this life how to diminish ourselves, how to become small, how to become of no consequence, how to take no risks in this life at all for fear of the judgment or the abuse that would be heaped on our shoulders and on our spirits. We've lived with that kind of world abuse throughout our lives and we come in this moment of prayer to say no more. We are tired of playing a role in somebody else's game. 
We are tired of diminishing ourselves before your greatness, knowing that what you are trying to give to us is great and glorious and of wonder to be beheld. And our shrinking from the glory of God, our shrinking away from the story that you are wanting us to live, does nothing to build the kingdom of God in this world. Not one thing. So teach us this day to live in a posture of openness, of self-awareness, allowing our eyes to see what it is that we are so gloriously getting right, that we are getting so right that the people of God, uh, people around us who are watching us and delighting in us feel the giftedness that we are wanting to heap on their heads, a beauty, a glory. And where we are getting it not so right or imperfectly or just a titch away from glorious, God, won't you work within us? Reminding us that our goal in life was never to be perfect. Our goal in this lifetime is to be obedient to what you are doing in our lives and how your will can be merged with our own to create a story that we never dreamed possible, but with open hands and expectant hearts we receive this day. So as disciples of a living Christ, we come to you this day knowing that when we pray about a kingdom to come, it's not something that is done over us or at a distance from us. But this prayer that we pray about the kingdom of God is something that you are inviting us to be intimately involved with, deep in our own souls, but also in the investments that we're making in the people around us, our children, our children's children, our neighbors, our friends, our, our best friend in all of the world can be touched by our desire to build this kingdom when we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Put my book too far away from me. So, is there a place for each of us where we no longer yearn to be elsewhere? But that our work, our humble, obedient work today is to soften, wait, and pay attention to everything that we are doing. I imagine this will make us more humble people. Just a few words before I say goodbye this morning. Um, Tomorrow night, you're not going to want to miss it, Sing Along Vespers will be live on Facebook and on our website, and Phil um, will be playing some music. Uh, like I said on Sunday, we did not send the music out because Dave Stout included the music right on the slides. So you'll be able to just turn on whatever device you'll, you'll be on tomorrow night at 7 o'clock, and we'll, you'll be able to sing the glory of God. I hope you have a great time doing that. I know I will myself. Um, and then... Uh, just just a little word. Uh, in two weeks, um, 
from today, we're going to be starting a whole new midday theme. It's going to be practices for the underground church. What are some practices that you and I can include in our everyday? So this will have a, um, maybe a little bit more practical feel of my offering to you things that you might want to include in your daily practices with God. Uh, look for more out on our Facebook page. Um, there'll be some things sent. There's a newsletter being created and it will probably be on our website as well. So practices for the underground church and the theme for the preaching will be stories from the underground church or when the church was strongest. It isn't always when we're in cathedrals and depending on our great organs and musicians, sometimes the church is the greatest in the underground. So stay tuned. Um, in the meantime, my friends, be at peace. Find ways to confirm your hope in God this day. Find ways to love on one another until we're together again, whether that be online or in our church. And that is always a glorious place to be. My friends, be at peace this day. Enjoy every beautiful moment. Amen.